Okay, so um, basically from, you know, what we're going to look at today. So it's really kind of a continuation of Tuesday's lecture, basically, where we kind of started to go through the process from starting from a kind of a random walk description and kind of trying to describe population level measures. And we went through kind of a step-by-step -step process going through various types of random walks from a very simple one-on-one -on -one dimensional lattice up to where we kind of stopped, which was this kind of general position jump random walk, which was making kind of, dis, uh, kind of making uh, uh, jumps in space, you know, and but they could be in any direction. Now, what we're going to look at in the first part of today's lecture is then the final class of random walk that I wanted to describe. And then in the second part, we're gonna have a, we're gonna basically go through a few applications. And really, you know, I'm not quite sure how many I'll kind of actually get through those. I kind of wanted to go through a few of those to then kind of show how we then kind of take these models and start applying apply them to real world problems. And in doing so, what kind of new questions that kind of raises in terms of what extra detail we want to start incorporating into these models. So that's kind of the plan for today's lecture. Uh, so just a very quick recap of um, the what we were looking at in the second part of Tuesday's lecture. So we were looking at kind of movement in n dimensions. And in particular, we considered these two types of movement, a position jump random walk, where movement occurs through instantaneous jumps in position, and a velocity jump random walk, where movement occurs through smooth, ru smooth runs, followed by a tumbling, where you've got effectively an instantaneous change of a new velocity. So kangaroos were my kind of model animal for the position jump, sharks were my model animal for a velocity jump type process. Now, for the position jump random walk, uh, we went through a kind of a derivation of the um, of the of a of the macroscopic model for something like the population density, and we set that up for what we would call a myopic random walker. So you sense based on the information you have at your current location. We made the, made the position jump random walk a little bit simpler in the fact that the jumps were of a fixed length. Um, so you kind of jump to any point on a kind of a unit sphere surrounding from your current position. And then when you kind of go through your kind of um, expansions and scaling arguments, you could derive this sort of macroscopic model there. It's basically of the form of a diffusion advection type equation. You've got an advection term here, which uh, describes a drift in the direction of your um, expectation of k, where k is the distribution to choose your new directions. And then the right-hand side is a little, well, it's kind of a, it's a diffusion type term, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's just kind of a anisotropic diffusion type term here, but this kind of diffusion tensor matrix appears fully inside this double gradient operator. And as I say, we derive that model. But the key point, as I say, is each of these, it, it, these kind of macroscopic parameters, this kind of drift and diffusion tensor, depend fundamentally on, on the underlying statistics of your, of the, of your um, directional distribution for choosing a new direction. So the question now we're going to ask is, what do we get for the corresponding velocity jump random walk process? <laughs> So let's go to that. And as I say, this is now even a slightly more sophisticated description of movement. We now assume that my population moves through runs in space, followed by tumbling events where we choose a new velocity. And therefore, at each tumbling event, that new velocity is going to be chosen according to some distribution function Q. And to set this up, let's consider the following gem general assumptions. We're going to assume that my tumbling probability is effectively a Poisson process. So um, turns will be exponentially distributed. We'll have some rate parameter for that mu. Um, we'll assume that my tumbling is instantaneous. So, you know, this is like sharks that can't stop swimming, that we don't have any resting at the time when we kind of do our tumble. We're going to assume that there's no interactions, basically, between our individuals. And as I said, this kind of Q is the kind of the key modeling decision that we're going to need to make. It's the probability of choosing some new velocity V given 
that an individual is at time t position x and had has previous velocity v dash. So that's the going to be the key modeling decision. And Q is really, as I say, it's a distribution distribution over some velocity space. And because we're considering biological um, particles, the range of speeds will, of course, be over some sort of finite range. You know, if we're kind of taking this out to you know, the, the, the kind of the kind of these 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 sort of things come from areas of statistical mechanics and then kind of gaseous particles, you can allow those speeds to go up to infinity. But these are biological parameters biological particles, so those speeds are going to be finite. And it was just as a point, you know, to say, I'm setting this up in a relatively simple framework, but it can be extended. You can kind of go to tumbling probabilities that are not Poisson, something like a power law distribution. And you know, if I have time, I may talk about that, that kind of um, extension at the end of today's class. You can also kind of take non-instantaneous tumbling, that you have a resting state um, between them as well. And you can also kind of consider interactions as well, actually. So there are various ways, as I say, to extend this framework. But that's anyway the way we're going to set it up. Okay. So that's kind of my, my uh, model. And from this sort of, from this kind of velocity jump random walk, you can write down what we call the transport equation. It's effectively a kinetic equation to describe the particle density P. And that takes the following form. So I'd say it's a transport equation. I'm not going to go into the derivation of this, but essentially this is just the a continuous formulation of that velocity jump random walk process. You have a, it's an evolution equation for how the particle density with uh, time t, position x, and with velocity v is evolving. There's a term here on the left-hand side here. This is, this is the gradient with respect to x. This is describing my, my running process that I'm, you know, that I'm moving through space through this kind of continuous runs. So that's my kind of running part here. And then the right-hand side is describing my turning process. At rate mu, I make a turn. So I've kind of got a loss um, due to kind of doing a turn. But then, of course, I have a gain turn here from particles that were moving previously with some velocity v dash that turn into velocity v. Okay, so that's, as I say, that's the kind of the transport equation, which is my continuous formulation of that velocity jump random walk process. Okay, now, in order to kind of set this up now in a way that basically allows me to kind of draw a connection with that position jump random walk, we're going to make even a further few simplifications. We're going to assume that my new velocity is independent of the previous velocity. So you know, that, that's, going to be, that's going to be kind of one assumption. I'm going to assume that my, my choice of Q is effectively myopic. So it's going to be based on some evaluation centered at my current position. And I'm also going to assume that we've got a fixed speed. So you, know, you just move with some speed s, which is, well, clearly going to be greater than zero, basically. And as I say, we don't necessarily have to make these assumptions. It's really just to basically put this into a very similar um, framework to that position jump random walk earlier. OK. And then we're going to define our macroscopic density. And my macroscopic density is simply the, the density of particles that I see at a position, particular point in space. And so that's simply the integral of V over the velocity space, basically. And the key thing we want to do is to de um, derive an equation for this macroscopic density. OK. Now. Given these assumptions, in that sort of in that sort of context, once I kind of do that, I get a much simpler looking transport equation because Q is now not depending on V dash. Then this, you know, then then that kind of will simply come out because it's a probability distribution. It's going to integrate to one, and therefore we get everything much more simple here. And now I'll we'll say from this equation, we want to get our uh, we want to get an an evolution equation for you. Okay. Okay. And just as a kind of point of note, 
yeah, I've kind of I put this uh, I put the x notation here just to denote that it's the gradient with respect to x. And here on, whenever we see the gradient, we're going to assume that basically that it's just the gradient with respect to x. It's just t uh, compacting down the notation. So how can we do this? Well, there's kind of various ways that you can go from this um, from this kind of transport equation up to a macroscopic model. I'm only going to kind of go through in detail one of those there. Um, but, you know, essentially, you know, three, three kind of major ways are to use kind of a moment closure approach, a hyperbolic scaling and a parabolic scaling. And as I say, I'm going to kind of concentrate on this first one, this moment closure here. But there are further sort of methods. And if anybody's interested in this, then um, myself and Thomas Hillen wrote a kind of a little review article on this here from about 2013, where we went through each of these different sort of approaches. So... But as I say, that's it. That's the kind of the, that's, that's what we're going to now look at and say we're going to use the moment closure approach. So we start with our kinetic transport equation. And as I say, this is now formulated in this sort of very simple sort of framework, basically, where we do, uh, where we don't depend on pre, where, where my Q doesn't depend on the previous direction. Uh, we have a constant speed and, um, and, we, uh, and we assume my Q is based on kind of, um, uh, myopic information. And as I said, Q is a probability distribution. So when we kind of, you know, so it's clearly got to satisfy the constraints that we have for that. So that's going to be an important sort of um, property to remember when we kind of go forward. And the, the kind of the nice thing about going through the moment closure approach is that we can kind of go through this through basically just thinking about the um, um, various statistical measures. So the first thing to note is the expectation and the variance of my, um, of my turning distribution Q. Those are very straightforward statistical definitions. We'll define my expectation Q simply using the standard um, definition for the expectation. And then we'll also define the variance covariance matrix as well as that, just using the standard definition for that. Okay, and as I say, those are things that clearly are can be obtained from analyzing data. Potentially, we could we you know if we're analyzing how an individual is moving through the environment, we could come we could kind of approximate its turns according to some turning distribution, and then these kind of eq and vq will come out as statistical properties of that turning distribution q. So we've got the expectation and the variance of Q, and we want to get some similar quantities for my population P. But of course, we can't do that directly because the population is not necessarily going to integrate to one. So the way we do that is through effectively a normalized version of the population, which we're going to call P hat. And that normalized version is simply P hat is equal to P over my macroscopic density. And then, of course, this then will satisfy the, um, um, this, the, this kind of p hat will integrate to one when I integrate over velocity. So in a similar way, we can describe, we can define the expectation of p hat, and we can define the variance covariance matrix of p hat. Okay. But as I say, essentially, we're just lay, lay, laying down some um, statistical measures related to my um, related to the my turning distribution Q and my population P here. Okay, so that's kind of the, that's kind of the that's kind of the the laying down of definitions. Let's now kind of go through go through the process and and they're relatively straightforward uh, um, set of um, um, uh, 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 calculations that we need to do. We go for we, we start with my um, with my transport equation. And the first thing to do is just to try integrating with respect to V. So let's just go through that. So we just kind of take that equation, integrate with respect to V, and just writing directly this down here, we get the, we'll get something that looks like this. And then when you actually kind of go through term by term, we can see actually that we can, you know, we can kind of write these down a lot more simply. You know, P is just my population. So we, when we integrate over V, that first term is simply the um, my macroscopic density U, uh, sorry, the derivative of my macroscopic 
happens to you with respect to time. That second term for my definition for the expectation of p hat is simply this quantity here. And then on the right hand side, well, you know, that's simply the integral of p over v, so it's at u. Q is a turning distribution, so that integrates to one. And therefore, actually, very simply, we can see that those terms will cancel each other out. So that first step just gives me a straightforward conservation law. Okay, so absolutely straightforward integration through here and using those kind of various definitions that we introduced on the previous slide. Okay, so integrating with respect to V gives me this conservation law. So what do we do next? Well, rather than just straightforwardly integrating with respect to V, let's now multiply through by V and then integrate that with respect to V instead. So again, it's just integration that we're doing here. It's going to look a little bit more complicated, but you know, it's essentially the same set of, set of steps. We multiply through by V, we integrate over, uh, uh, and then we integrate over V. So you do that, and you can again go through and kind of just look at these term by term. That first term there, when you go back to those definitions, is simply um, uh, the time derivative of the expectation of P hat times U. The second term can be kind of reformulated in this way there, just to just a kind of a reformulation of that. This integral here, uh, going back to those definitions, is simply the expectation of p hat times u. And again, we kind of actually, when we kind of look at this integral here, it's simply the expectation of q. Okay, so, but, you know, again, you know, this is, this is really then just kind of going back and looking at those various um, definitions that we came up with on the first, those various sort of statistical uh, measures on that previous, that we kind of looked at a couple of slides ago. Okay, so that's kind of that. Um, that gives us then an equation of this form here. And we can still do a little bit of further work here. We've got this, you know, this kind of this kind of second term here on the left hand side. We can do a little bit of work on this there. Um, so we're going to kind of we can kind of um, kind of reformulate this. And the way we can reformulate this is to go back to effectively the variance of p hat. So if we kind of take the variance of p hat and multiply that by u, then that effectively is given by this integral there. And you can expand out that integral to give me a term, which is effectively this, what, what we're kind of trying to get a, an approximation, uh, uh, sorry, what we're trying to reformulate here, the integral of V um, times the transpose of V P D V, and then some various other terms, but those various other terms ni get nicely compacted down. So as a result of those calculations, we get an expression, um, for that integral in terms of the variance of p hat and the expectation of p hat. Okay, so this, as I say, is just a, again, just sort of relatively straightforward calculations that you can very much do by hand. And as I say, I will be sending through my slides for this later. So you, if, you, you know, if, if you want to, you can kind of look through the details of this. But essentially, once we've got this, this formulation here, we can then write that equation above. Now is this slightly more complicated looking equation. It's now, it's now an equation for um, it's kind of this kind of uh, this evolution equation for EP hat of U. And it kind of depends on various sort of statistical quantities. It de depends on the expectation of P hat. It depends on the variance P hat. It depends on the expectation of Q, it depends on the expectation of P hat over here, et cetera. So it's again kind of, you know, related to all of those statistical measures that we introduced. Okay, so what have we got so far? We've done two rounds of integration essentially in this sort of steps here. We've just gone through, you know, we first just straightforwardly integrated with respect to V, then in the second time we multiplied by V and then integrated that 
effectively, just for two integration steps. And that's given us then two equations. This, this first equation, which was simply this conservation law, and then the second equation here, which is a little bit more complicated, but still, you know, it's a um, it, it's a it, it, it's a it's an equation that we can work with. Okay, so what can we do with this now? Well, let's see what we we need to do in order to solve this. Well, clearly, if we wanted to solve one to get an equation for u, then we need to know what e p hat is. You know, that's clearly you know that's e p hat comes into is as into this kind of um, into this advection velocity of u over here. So we need e p hat to be able to kind of solve for u in equation one. Well, that's okay because we can deduce e p hat from this second equation here. But again, we've got a little bit of a problem for doing this because in turn we're going to need to know what v p hat is. So even though you know, we, 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 could, we can get EP hat from equation two. We need something else in order to work out what VP hat is. And this then essentially gives rise to what we would call a moment closure problem. You know, in order to solve these two equations, we need, an, we need a equation for VP hat. And we could do that by going through another round of integration in order to get that equation for VP hat. But when you do that, that will in turn depend on a higher order moment. It will depend on something else. And that will just carry on ad infinitum. So the question is, is what do you do in order to close this down? And that's where you need to make some sort of approximation. We need to close this at some step in order to um, in order to be able to get a set of closed equations that can be solved. And we're, gonna, we're not going to go through any further rounds of integration, but of course you can actually do that, but we're going to stop this here because so we can get to our kind of uh, um, answer. And we're going to make the following two assumptions. And the first one is, is to assume that VP hat is approximately what we, the V of P hat E, where P hat E is the equilibrium distribution. And I'll explain more, I'll kind of show exactly what that means in a moment, actually. There. But that's the first assumption that we're going to make in order to close this. And the second assumption that we're going to make is what's um, often called the fast flux relaxation. And that's a, effectively to assume that the second equation in this above is such that the, you know, the right-hand side is effectively zero. Okay, so. Those are the two assumptions that we're going to make that's going to allow us to close these equations. And I should actually just kind of point out that you know, these kind of techniques have really been kind of borrowed from you know, kind of the theory of kind of gases, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's a, it's very much a physics sort of context, basically. And we're kind, of, we're kind of almost arbitrarily taking these assumptions and putting them into a biological setting. It's not really clear if that's actually a valid thing to do or not, actually. So, you know, you, know, you have to take this under, under those kind of limitations of this approach. But it still is going to allow us to get down into an equation which we can then solve. Anyway, those are the two assumptions. Well, what does that kind of first assumption say? It would say we kind of we assume that VP hat is approximately VP hat T, and VP hat T is going to simply, by definition, that's the variance of P hat T. It's going to be calculated as such. And when I talk about this as being the equilibrium approximation. What I mean by that is, you know, for P hat T, if we go back to my transport equation, it's simply, it's simply the equilibrium approximation. It's simply when that's it, when we set that as equal to zero, we solve P E in terms, and then we kind of solve P E in terms of the right hand side there. So P E is going to be UQ, or P E hat is simply going to be equal to Q. Okay. So P hat E is simply my turning distribution Q in this, um, in, this, in this assumption here. Okay. And once you've kind of done that, you can also get, um, you can also kind of get, rewrite kind of E P hat E and E P hat E. It's also go, it's simply going to be the expectation of Q. Okay. So that's kind of what assumption one tells me. 
What about assumption two? Oh, okay. So, so I should just note on that then what that what the overall result of this is that the variance of p hat we're assuming is approximately the variance of my turning distribution q. Okay, so that's the upshot of this assumption a one. Okay, so that's assumption a one. Assumption a two, as I say, we make we make this approximation here. We assume that that kind of that kind of um, that kind of um, uh, that kind of left hand side is effectively zero here. So we um, we 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 can we have this we have this assumption here. And now basically we can kind of substitute from the above equation from our kind of assumption a one e p hat. Um, we've identified as being equal to e q. V p hat is equal to v q. Um, so, so um, as a result of that, um, we kind of just do a little bit of rearrangement and we get EP hat of U is equal to minus one of U times the gradient of VQ U, um, uh, uh, plus um, uh, grad dotted with VQ U plus the expectation of Q times U. Okay. So, so that's kind of my that kind of gives me um, an expression for e p hat u that I can eventually substitute into the equation one. And when you do that, the resulting equation is this one here. And if this is looking familiar, then indeed, that's because this is very similar to what we got when we went through from the position jump random walk model. Because this notation here is absolutely as before, this colon here is this kind of double summation over second derivatives. So the result of all of this is effectively that same macroscopic, uh, uh, mac sorry, the, the macroscopic model as a result of this moment closure, is that same um, drift anisotropic diffusion type model of earlier. But this has now been obtained from this velocity jump random walk model. We get a macroscopic equation where we get a drift, which is based on the expectation of my turning distribution Q. And we get a diffusion tensor matrix appearing right inside this sort of double grad operator here, which is based on the um, covariance matrix of my turning distribution Q. Okay. So essentially, whether or not we start with a position jump random walk or a velocity jump random walk, we can get give rise to the same overall form of macroscopic equation. Now, that, as I say, that was kind of our, the way you kind of do this for a um, for this kind of moment closure. And of course, it can actually be kind of extended up these sort of thing. You can kind of do your moment closure at higher sort of levels and so forth. And that will actually generate sort of, you know, more complicated sort of models for this process. But as I say, we're going to just sort of stop at this point here um, for today's class. But very briefly, without kind of actually going through too many of the details, I just wanted to kind of a little bit kind of talk about the kind of the way, you know, how this kind of works using those kind of parabolic or hyperbolic scalings earlier. And they kind of rely on a slightly different sort of, um, you know, kind of idea, basically. Um, in some sense, they are somewhat sort of similar, but parabolic hyperbolic scalings effectively instead involve some sort of zooming out of your space or time scales, basically. It's looking at the problem from, a different sort of um, a, a different scale in space and time, and it's it's kind of quite easy to kind of motivate these kind of parabolic or hyperbolic scalings by considering the differences in you know when you're kind of looking at say the movement of E. coli at a microscopic scale. So if you kind of you know if you kind of do sort of um, you know, kind of videos of kind of these kind of E. coli coli doing their kind of run and tumble sort of movement where they kind of move through space and tumble occasionally, then 
you know, looked at that scale, this is occurring on a spatial scale of microns and on a temporal scale of seconds. You know, it's, you know, that's the kind of the space and time scale that you're looking at E. coli movement when you're looking at that run and tumble process. But the macroscopic problem is really kind of the question of when, how this kind of translates to the things that are we observing when you're kind of zooming out in space. And for example, a kind of a classic sort of problem there is how this kind of chemotactic run and tumble at this microscopic scale translates to pattern formation at this kind of macroscopic scale. That if you put a population of E. coli into some sort of petri dish and then kind of watch them spreading out over time, they're able to organize into some sort of pattern of spots, basically. And each of these spots that you see here, this kind of spot here or this spot here is not a single E. coli, it's actually a population of potentially a million E. coli. So we're at a completely different spatial scale here. We're at a kind of a scale of centimeters and these patterns are forming over a time scale of hours. So you know, whether or not you're like kind of studying kind of E. coli at a microscopic scale or a macroscopic scale, you know, you, you're, you're looking at so you're, you're looking at things that kind of do two very different spatial and temporal scales. So um, E. coli movement at that kind of a microscopic scale, you know, you know, if we kind of take my space as being kind of millimeters, um, then, you know, at that kind of scale, you make a turn roughly every second and they move about 10 microns every second. So my kind of speed is about 0 0.01 millimeters per second and my turning rate is about once per second. But it doesn't make sense to keep that sort of time scale when we move out to the macroscopic. You know, these patterns form over with the order of around, say, three hours or so, effectively. Three hours is around 10 to the power of four seconds. So if we kind of take that kind of re, you know, um, rescaling of time, then those speeds and turning rates then suddenly look like around 10 to the power two millimeters every three hours and a turning rate of around 10 to the power of four every three hours. And that reconversion of your time scales basically allows you to introduce some effectively small parameter because that's that kind of, if we kind of introduce um, that kind of S is a, uh, we can write that as one over epsilon. We can write that mu as one over epsilon squared, where epsilon is around 0 0.01, so something, you know, something suitably small. And that and therefore kind of allows you to do effectively a kind of a rescaling of your um, rescaling of your problem. In a parabolic scaling, you would change the space and time scales. So you'd introduce a kind of a, a scaling of time, a scaling of space. Once you kind of do that, you kind of introduce it into your equations, you kind of get kind of small parameters in the, in the various terms of your equation. And then you can perform expansions on epsilon and go through, and then under a certain set of assumptions, you can derive a, a macroscopic equation. And for example, you can obtain an anisotropic diffusion equation if you assume some sort of symmetric Q. And actually that's completely cons co consistent with what we just did for moment closure, because it, in that kind of moment closure that we did before, if you assume your symmetric Q, you do indeed get to this same anisotropic diffusion equation. So in a parabolic scaling, the approach instead is to come and change your space and time scales in a way that then allows you to kind of do expansions that kind of allow you to get to a kind of a macroscopic equation that way. And that's a parabolic scaling, hyperbolic scaling. Instead, you choose a slightly different scaling. You now kind of scale both time and space in the same sort of way. You know, that kind of does something slightly different. And you need to apply different sort of um, a, a, expansions, but you can go through those expansions. And as a first order approximation, you get a drift equation, but you can also carry on and do higher order approximations as well that introduce some sort of diffusive correction. Okay. But I don't want to go through those details, but if anybody's interested on 
on those, and in particular in the context of this space simple transport equation, then that's actually what we kind of covered in this review article from 2013, basically. Okay, so. That kind of, as I say, kind of shows how we, how we can kind of, how we can go through this and kind of derive macroscopic equations for these um, velocity jump random and walk type processes. So let's say now, now kind of summarize all of this before we, we, we're able to kind of use, you know, the final 40 minutes or so for a few kind of applications. So random walks are a good way to describe the movement of an individual or at a microscopic level, because basically you can kind of formulate them according to the statistics that you can measure at the individual level. You can kind of calculate the kind of mean speeds, mean turning rates, turning distributions, and then set down a random walk to describe that kind of movement process. It's still an approximation of the actual movement, but it's an, appro it's an approximation that can really be kind of statistically kind of formulated according to statistical data. And this has been, this has had a kind of a long history in, um, in kind of looking at chemotaxis type models uh, without kind of going into too many details. That kind of very first paper of Patlack was incredibly influential. That wasn't specifically modeling chemotaxis, but was modeling a random movement where you had some external bias that could be chemotaxis. So he can't kind of describe that through some e external bias, and the reason these are kind of often kind of attributed as being early chemotaxis equations is because that early that external bias effectively comes into a drift, um, an extra drift into the population, and you get essentially. I mean, it's a lot more complicated than that very simple sort of formulation that I just considered, but you essentially get a drift diffusion type equation in that kind of mass macroscopic uh, model. So it was very much a kind of a precursor to this kind of idea, these ideas of um, modeling this kind of, um, this kind of um, bias due to sensing a gradient through some sort of, uh, uh, through some sort of um, drift component into your, um, in, into your um, model. So that was kind of back like in the kind of 50s. And then kind of key works that kind of built on some of these ideas where that was really kind of very much from the 80s onwards, basically. Key studies of Alt in 1980, and then another paper of Othman, Dunbar, and Dalton. That's particularly worth mentioning because that's where really these position jump and velocity jump frameworks were really kind of laid down in detail. And then various authors such as um, Angela Stevens, Hans Othmer, Thomas Hillen, and others kind of then from the 90s onwards and, and really lots lots more actually I, I don't want to kind of go into any more sort of detail on that um the only other thing i kind of want to then kind of actually kind of highlight on this is actually what this is kind of allowed is in the context of something like e coli which can be very much thought of as a paradigm for this velocity jump random walk model what this is really allowed um um us to do is to kind of go from the level of intracellular signaling, how that intracellular signaling affects the turning behavior of, of individual cells and kind of translate that out through this velocity jump random walk to a macroscopic model. So those kind of macroscopic parameters really depend on the underlying dynamics of intracellular signaling. So really kind of connecting right down from the, the smallest microscopic details into a macroscopic framework. Okay. But anyway, as I say, that's kind of that's kind of um, you know, how this has kind of allowed us to evolve. And as I say, I'll be providing a list of references that kind of really kind of um, give these sort of various sort of um uh, some of these key studies. But I should say that there's a lot of people, and certainly even people in, I know that are in the audience that have been working on these types of models and kind of taking them in lots of new, exciting directions. Now, another kind of point I just wanted to say is that we've kind of discussed two general classes. We've discussed these position jump and velocity jump random walk. So whether or not you're kind of moving like a kangaroo or a shark. And what we've shown that if we've formulated these in, in a kind of an equivalent setting, you essentially get the same macroscopic equation. You know, we, you know, we specifically did that in that way and we got this sort of equation there. So, you know, 
But the velocity jump random walk, I think you can probably kind of agree, is overall a more realistic approach because you know not even kangaroos walk through kind of by making instantaneous jumps in space. The velocity jump random walk does describe continuous movement through space and can actually be quite precisely adapted, you know, to, to like those kind of um, kleinokinesis walks of things like E. coli, basically. So does this suggest that we should always use the velocity jump random walk when we try and model these things? Well, I think that's, that, that's probably fair enough if you're trying to model something like E. coli. That's really the paradigm of a velocity jump random walk. You know, you could... You, you know, it really does do like, so a velocity jump random walk is entirely appropriate in that case. But whether or not you need to use that kind of extra detail, you know, really depends on sort of data. And to give an insight, an illustration to this, this is the sort of data that you get from GPS tracking of um, individuals in the wild, like this kind of whale shark here. You, you put a GPS transmitter on it and it gives you a reading of the position at over time. And you get some sort of thing that looks like a kind of a random walk through space, probably a biased random walk for sure, but a random walk through space. But this is not, you know, these kind of straight lines here connecting points are not straight line movements because actually, you know, because of the limitations of GPS, GPS only provides information when the shark goes to the surface. The, the transmitter has to be above the water. So for a long time, it is below the surface, swimming below the surface, and you don't get a signal. So it's like four days apart from that, and it's clearly not moving in a kind of a straight line between those two points. It's, it's doing something in between that. So... In that sort of case, whether you know whether or not it's more appropriate to use a velocity jump random walk or a simpler position jump random walk is a little bit you know, kind of more clear, uh, less clear cut. Okay, I've also also kind of talked about that there's various ways to go from a velocity jump random walk to a macroscopic model, and the appropriate method is very much linked to what scale of interest that you're looking at, whether or not you're kind of out there where the kind of the parabolic scaling applies or whether or not something like a hyperbolic scaling is more appropriate and so forth. Okay. So anyway, that's just kind of summarizing those kind of results on random walks. So let's now kind of, for say, for the kind of final half an hour, an hour or so, let's just now kind of think about how we can now apply this to a couple of real world examples. So what this velocity jump random walk allows us to do is basically move through three separate scales. You can kind of formulate things down at the velocity jump random walk, and we can actually indeed do simulations of that, kind of Monte Carlo simulations of the movement of my individual particles. We've also got what we would call the mesoscopic scale, where this kind of transport equation, where we've got this, we've kind of got a continuous description, but that's kind of in terms of a population distributed over time, um, position and velocity. And then we've got that kind of fully macroscopic scaling as well, where you've kind of really moved out to kind of a macroscopic equation um, for this. So it's, it's kind of quite an advantageous sort of um, framework because you can study effectively the same problem using different models, three different models from kind of, you know, kind of individual velocity jump movements to kind of this mesoscopic scale through to this macroscopic scale. But we still need to kind of make decisions. And the key decision is how we're going to choose this Q. And that effectively um, detect, dictates the new direction. So you're going to need to kind of choose some form of directional distribution. And I'd say, I'm going to always assume that we've got this constant speed S in the, you know, what sort of follows and stuff. But So our key modeling decision is really in terms of choosing this Q, this directional distribution. So based on this, let's consider kind of navigation as kind of a model sort of problem. You know, this problem of how animals get through the environment. This is kind of a problem that's been studied for many, many, many years. And basically animals kind of, animals need to start somewhere. They need to get some sort of goal. And that's been described as kind of various sort of phases that kind of you have some long distance phase where you're using very large scale cues, maybe following the position of the sun, maybe following magnetic field information as kind of a homing phase where you're kind of maybe 
kind of picking up particular environmental features. And then there's a kind of pinpointing the goal phase. For example, you recognize your particular tree where you have your nest hole. But basically, anyway, what it means is that along your kind of navigation route, you have various cues and they are giving you an indication of the direction of the target, some sort of some sort of bias towards the goal that you're trying to do. That. But it's going to fluctuate across the route in terms of the strength of that kind of bias. OK, so. So if we've got anyway, we've got bias towards the direction of the target, then a very natural choice for my turning distribution is to use a kind of a unimodal von Mises distribution. Um, and this is basically a directional distribution. I'm assuming movement in 2D here, but you can actually extend this up to 3D as well. And the universal, the, the kind of the von Mises distribution is a very commonly used distribution in the area of directional statistics. And it's commonly used because you can think of it as an analog to the normal distribution on a circle. So, and consequently, it's probably be, it's the most, the, the kind of the, 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 the most used distribution in the context of circular statistics. It's like a normal distribution on a circle. And it basically gives me a, uh, it's basically a probability distribution for choosing some direction n, and it basically is based on two parameters, a dominant direction, so the, the direction you're most likely to move in, and some concentration parameter kappa, which indicates just how likely that direction is. So kind of a high kappa will give you a highly concentrated distribution in the dominant direction. So that's my von Mises distribution. And it's based on, a, it, it's, it's kind of given by this form here. And this kind of IJK denotes the modified Bessel function of first kind order J, uh, uh, sorry, uh, first kind um, um, order zero in this case here. Uh, so, uh, and that just enters into the, um, uh, the, the normalization of this distribution. Okay, so that's, that, that's kind of the von Mises distribution. And the advantage of actually using this is that if we kind of set my turning distribution according to this, then and then I kind of try and calculate those kind of um, those macroscopic drift and macroscopic diffusion tensor parameters, I can actually do this and perform explicit calculations. I can do that. I can go through and kind of write down my drift in terms of the kind of the speed of my particles and the parameters of my turning distribution, that kind of that kind of concentration parameter kappa and that dominant direction um, nu here. And I can do that for my um, my 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 drift in, and that gives me a kind of a drift in the dominant direction, which is what we would expect. My particles will move towards that um, in that direction. And you can also do that for the diffusion tensor matrix. It looks a little bit kind of messy, but it basically gives me a diffusion tensor matrix that can be decomposed into an isotropic part and an anisotropic part. But anyway, as I say, what this fundamentally gives me is a way to directly connect the measurements at the individual level to the coefficients at the macroscopic level. Those kind of that kind of turning rate that. It, that, that kind of um, likely direction, et cetera, et cetera, go directly into my macroscopic coefficients for A and D. Okay. And the calculations here are in a kind of paper with Thomas Hillen from 2017, which are, again will be in the list of references that will accompany the, the slides. Okay. Okay. So that kind of goes in there. So for this kind of this von Mises distribution, we can explicitly calculate my A and D. And just as a kind of a note here, what we kind of get here, well, you know, you kind of have to know how the kind of the, these are all kind of um, these modified Bessel functions that these are based on, basically. But it gives it it gives the behavior that you would expect to. If we set my concentration parameter cal kappa to zero then that von Mises distribution just becomes a uniform distribution on a circle at that point. The drift becomes negligible. The diffusion becomes isotropic. 
and we just get an isotropic diffusion equation at the macroscopic limit. If instead my concentration parameter goes to infinity, in that case, the von Mises distribution tends to a Dirac distribution that's centered on my, my dominant direction. The drift tends to, we get, we get a kind of a macroscopic drift in the direction of, the, of nu with speed s, and the diffusion tends to zero. So we go to a kind of a pure drift limit. So it gives you the behavior that you would expect. But what about for other kappa? Well, in that case, we would either need to directly solve my macroscopic DA um, equation here, or we can actually do a method of applying expansions. So, well, directly solving it is, is, is only really possible in kind of um, very specific um, circumstances, but it is indeed possible to write down the fundamental solution for this system. You get a fundamental solution, um, which again kind of depends obviously on that kind of A and D, etc. And what that kind of gives then is a kind of a, is the sort of behavior that you expect that for some sort of population that is kind of moving towards some sort of target. It moves, you know, that kind of population will move in the direction of that target, so according to the size of A, but then there'll be an anisotropic spread of the population about the kind of the mean position, basically. So you get this kind of, you get this kind of mixture between a diff, um, an anisotropic diffusion process and a drift towards the target. Okay, so you can kind of, you can kind of write down a fundamental solution for this problem. Now, the other way to kind of get a little bit of insight into this equation is, okay, so, so it's just summarizing what I say, you get drift in direction A, but uh, with a diffusion that um, leads to spread about my, uh, anastropic spread about my mean position. You can also do expansions in order to get a simpler sort of model than this star, because basically there's expansions for my various modified Bessel functions. These are all kind of standard e expansions that you find you know, in finding various sort of mathematical literature, they kind of, um, they kind of you get these standards that you can expand your modified Bessel functions as in this sort of way here. And as a result, you can kind of write down expansions for each of these kind of I1, a kappa over I naught to kappa, you can expand those in terms of kappa, you can expand I2 kappa over I naught to kappa, you can expand this kind of I1, squared over I naught squared, et cetera. You can write all of those expansions out in terms of kappa. And then that allows you then to write down approximations according to the size of kappa, which is effectively according to the strength of the bias towards some, according to the target direction, the direction in which you're trying to move, okay? And if you, if you do this just at the first order approximation, then actually everything simplifies very simply. Your advection simply becomes an advection in the dominant direction. The diffusion tensor matrix simply becomes an isotropic diffusion process. And your macroscopic equation simply reduces down to an isotropic diffusion advection equation. So, it will simplify down to an even simpler partial differential equation model. But of course, if you, if, you know, that's only really valid in the case where kappa is relatively small, that you have a relatively weak bias in your system. You can also obtain higher order approximations here as well. Okay, so, okay, so, so you could, anyway, but that's, that's kind of just kind of giving a little bit of, you know, kind of insight into how, what sort of work you can kind of then do on this macroscopic data equation. How would we go about incorporating navigation cues? Well, the way to do that is to effectively define some navigation vector field, some, some vector field W that basically tells you from a given position in space and time, what the direction of the target is. And that navigation vector field then simply informs the navigation strength kappa in that von Mises distribution and the dom dominant direction nu in that von Mises distribution. So this W of exity directly informs 
the inputs for that von Mises distribution. And in a very general setting, W is just simply some sort of um, vector field that you lay down. But if you're trying to do this in a real world scenario, that vector field could be dependent on, for example, the geomagnetic field, because certain animals use that geomagnetic field information. Okay. So you kind of you kind of bring that into the model. And W could be determined by all of your kind of various orienting fields. It could be dependent on chemical fields, topography, geomagnetic fields, and so forth. And let's just now kind of link everything back again to chemotaxis, because if you wanted to model a chemotaxis response, then you would assume that that navigation field depended on the spatial gradient of your chemical substance. So you would define your kind of W to be basically based on the chemical gradient. So maybe some sort of sensitivity response that depends on the strength of the concentration and on the gradient, and then some sort of direction that is according to the direction of the gradient of my C. And if you kind of do this, you put it, you kind of set your W according to this and take a particular simple choice and then use those expansions, then in that first order approximation, and again, I'm going through these very sort of quickly, but when you kind of put these into then those kind of first order approximations, you again recover that Keller-Siegel model. So again, we all kind of, get, we can all eventually get back to those very simple classical continuous models that have been proposed to describe biological movements. Okay. So all of this kind of can go back to those sort of problems. But of course, when we move out into the real world, we also need to start expanding this to kind of consider how things become more complicated in, in the kind of the real world sort of case. Okay. And actually, again, I should just point out, you can do higher order approximations and then you get kind of modified Keller-Siegel type equations that are kind of more, yeah, have kind of more sophisticated sort of properties, basically. Okay. What sort of things that could we do to kind of extend this? Well, one would be to incorporate non-locality. And to do this, let's look at kind of a case study of hilltopping. I was up at the top of Etna a few years ago, and actually I noticed there that even though it was a very barren landscape, there were lots of butterflies there. And that didn't make sense because there was no vegetation there, so nowhere really to kind of um, lay eggs or really anything like that. So I kind of asked an entomologist about what was happening here, and he suggested that it was a process of hilltopping. Certain insects are known to accumulate at summits as a way of increasing their likelihood of finding a mate. You, know, you, need, to, you need to find a mate quickly as a butterfly because you only live a few days. So it's imperative to find a mate quickly. So if you agree to meet in certain places, that will increase your likelihood. And this is meant to be advantageous, particularly for rare species, but more generally, it's used for a model system for how the topography and the landscape can help structure populations. But sensing the elevation is primary a visual thing. You don't just look down, you have some visual range that allows you to see over some region. So actually, if you're looking around, you know, you, you, you may not kind of just move up the local gradient, you will try and find the highest peak in your immediate vicinity. And that then leads to the question of how far can actually an individual see? So this is kind of a, this is kind of a, a kind of a phenomenon in kind of ecology that's kind of leads to the concept of the perceptual range, which basically gives you, you know, the distance from which a particular landscape element can be perceived by some given animal. But more generally, this is actually true even for cellular populations, because cell populations can perceive chemicals at distances through phylopodia. Um, animals can spot objects from many body lengths away. It's not even just visual, because of course sound spreads even hundreds of kilometers in a marine environment that allows whales to 
communicate with other whales, maybe even a thousand kilometers away. So, you know, the perceptual range is very important for spreading information. Okay, so how could we do this? Well, to do this, you could assume that your, your individual samples its environment over some surrounding read, region, and maybe it kind of takes some sort of samples from some um, sphere of perceptual range R. So that would be the kind of the model here. You look around, you sample various sort of points, and, you know, and that gives you the information on your environment. And then according to that information, you can define a pull vector that will effectively say how attracted you are to one of those points that you have sampled. And that pull vector will give you, will, ba will basically be, give something like maybe it depends on how far that is away and it will depend on the information that you see at that point. So that would be the probability that a particular point is sampled. Um, and the strength of the attraction uh, towards the way of the point. You then define a navigation field that then integrates all of these, all of these, um, all of these points that you're sampled, and you can move this up into a continuous setting where you take lots and lots of samples, and then you have a navigation field that then depends on some non-local sampling of your environment. And the reason why I wanted to kind of then give this as a kind of a, a kind of an, a natural extension of this framework is because if we build a velocity jump random walk where you kind of do a sampling based on this non-local sampling, then you go through this process, substituting it into your dad equation. You take the first order approximation, and then you can start to recover those non-local models for movement that I was talking about back in the very first lectures that kind of, kind of have a non-local partial differential equation framework, which have been applied in various sort of areas from chemotaxis to swarming to adhesion type processes. Okay. So, these, these kind of, you know, through this framework, we can also recover these non-local PDE models as well. Okay. So that's kind, of, that's kind of one sort of extension that you could do, bring in non-locality. And just to kind of say, you know, we kind of did a study of this in the context of hilltopping. So there's been various sort of studies on that. We've kind of done that in kind of the real world environments there. And when you kind of model that, then, I mean, the results are kind of as expected. If you have very little perceptual range, your population tends to get trapped at lots of little local summits. If you have a vast perceptual range, it allows your population to, um, to kind of um, accumulate just on a few very dispersed summits. But really, as I say, what this kind of then allows us to do is by kind of comparing with the data from the studies, you can actually suggest from the modeling that perhaps the perceptual range of the butterflies is somewhere around the 50 meters range. We have no idea what that is because we don't know what butterflies' visual um, abilities are. But the modeling suggests that maybe they can detect roughly 25 to 50 meters as a range based, based on a comparison of what we get as a kind of a the population distributions that we get in our model compared to what they see in the experiments. And an even more general um, um, outcome from that result is that generally non-local sensing is a way that allows individuals to kind of iron out the natural noise that get, they get in their landscape. In a kind of in topography, you've got lots of local peaks, but you don't want to get trapped by an irrelevant peak Peak. You want to find kind of the dominant peaks in your environment. In a chemical environment as well, there's lots of stochasticity, but through non-local sensing, you could kind of iron out that noise in your landscape. Okay. Okay, so as I say, we can kind of incorporate perceptual range into that, and we can extend this then to get non-local uh, non formulations as well at our, a macroscopic level. We can also incorporate 
things like flow in the environment. And this now goes back to my turtle sort of population earlier, these kind of these turtles that are famous for doing this kind of this kind of migration from South America to Ascension Island right in the middle of the Atlantic. So this kind of phenomenal migration journey that turtles are famous for. Um, the time I, I, I did, I, I kind of talked about this kind of earlier, basically, so I won't go back. Go, go through that there. But the problem here is the question of how these turtles are able to find this target of around 10 kilometers isolated in the middle of the Atlantic. They don't have anything like a smartphone. And there's also complicated currents that they have to battle on the route on the journey as well. So that's kind of this classic problem of navigation. Well, the way the marine biologists oops, um, study this is they can't they, they, they don't track them over the full journey. They find an, a turtle that is nesting on the on the um, island. So they kind of find that's easy enough to find because you just find them as they kind of come up onto the beach. They then take them, put them a couple of hundred kilometers away from the island, attach a GPS transmitter, and then track the homing path as it tries to get back to the island. And they can do this because when the turtles come to the island over six months, they will lay about five or six clutches of eggs. So they want to go back to the island and lay as many eggs as possible while they're there. OK, so we've been recreating these experiments mathematically, but that, of course, needs to kind of basically extend this framework to incorporate the fact that you're moving in a flow. You can do that and you just get an extra flow in there. And sorry, I've called this the same thing W. I should have called that something else there. So that was uh, um, so w, w, I'll change that in the notes there to, to is, the, is now kind of the, the kind of the flow field. But um, there. But basically, as I say, it's a fairly straightforward extension of my modeling. And then we can do, we can then actually investigate the success of turtles in trying to find the, whoops, um, um, trying to find their island. And basically here we're showing both individual velocity, uh, kind of simulations of the kind of the velocity jump random walks and Monte Carlo simulations. And then the color map is showing my macroscopic models. This should also show the good correspondence between the two. And you can do this for kind of simple drifters or weak swimmers oops, or very strong swimmers. And you can kind of do that and then investigate oops, the homing success. OK, so that kind of that kind of allows you to kind of recreate these sort of things and see how successful the turtles are at getting back to the island. And actually, when we did this for realistic swimming speeds and turning rates, et cetera, for the turtles, based on the, based on the kind of the data that was obtained, we actually found that there was fairly uncertain homing success. The, tur the turtles were not brilliant at get getting back to the island. And actually, it turns out that that is actually the case, that we talk about them as being successful at getting to the island. But when you go back to studies, a lot of the turtles that they displaced tried to get back to the island, got very close in some instances, within 25 kilometers, but didn't find it, and eventually gave up and swam back to South America. OK, and actually, this is very topical because actually yesterday in The Guardian, there was even a kind of a news report on this, that turtles really are not as good at navigators as we think they are. OK. But anyway, again, it's just to show again how this framework can be taken, extended, and then kind of adapted to kind of a real world sort of problem. OK, so that was a kind of a, a kind of a second one. Now, kind of a final one that I want to kind of briefly go through is then to kind of think about other types of movement. You know, so the first one I, I was kind of talking about was kind of a unidirectional movement process that you had some target. You roughly knew where that 
you know, the, where, where that target was. So you had some bias in the direction of the target. And that's fine for things like kind of homing sort of homing cases like the turtles when they kind of roughly know where the island is. So they have a bias in that direction. But it's perhaps not appropriate to describe other types of things like the way animals or cells respond to linear features in the environment. And this is a, something that occurs in an ecology setting. So in ecology, um, this is a kind of a, this is kind of in northern Canada, um, in Alberta, in northern Canada there. And there for royal exploration, they have put in these kind of what are called seismic lines, these kind of lines, which are basically clearing of the vegetation, um, to, which they use for kind of oil exploration. And actually, these have had a dramatic impact on the wolf and caribou populations because the wolves tend to use these seismic lines moving along them as a faster way to search through their environment to find the caribou. So in the areas where these seismic lines have been introduced, the caribou populations have decreased and the wolves have effectively found a more efficient way to move through their environment. And cells also respond to these kind of linear features in the environment, because when you place motile cells on kind of environment that has this kind of, has kind of these linear features, they tend to orient themselves and move accordingly to that kind of, according to that kind of environmental, um, um, that, kind, that kind of, that kind of, um, uh, that kind of aspect of the environment they kind of have. So, so in this case here, you've got linear features. You're not necessarily moving just one direction along them. You can move either way. There's, you're moving along the axial direction of these linear features. So not necessarily left, not necessarily right. You can loop, move either way with equal likelihood. So that would be what we call a bidirectional movement, but we can kind of extend our we can very easily do that because we can just take that unimodal um, von Mises distribution and extend it out into a bimodal form, where now you can move equally, you move, you're equally likely to move in direction new or direction minus mu. And of course, you can do the same calculations and you can derive, you can calculate your advection. Your advection will now vanish in this sort of case. And the diffusion tensor matrix, again, becomes a kind of a mixture between isotropic diffusion and anisotropic diffusion. But now, of course, my macroscopic model, because we've lost that advection, is we've effectively now simply got this um, anisotropic diffusion type equation. OK, so that's kind of, that's kind of an example of that would be an example of a bidirectional navigation. OK, so. Again, to kind of go back to those case studies, kind of the final application that I kind of then want to consider then is how you can then use this to kind of study problems such as invasion, and in particular, the growth of glioblastomas. So these glioblastomas, as I explained in the first lecture, are these highly malignant cancers formed from the brain glial cells. And basically, the cells migrate and invade into surrounding healthy brain. And as I explained in that very first lecture, um, because they spread in a very anisotropic fashion, the actual spread of the cancer is often very distinct from the area to which they apply treatment. So they apply treatment over some area, it is based on what they can see from in imaging that the actual spread is likely to be different, and that leads to cells that remain untreated. And the reason, or the suggested reason for this, is because the brain is a very anisotropic environment, and in particular, it has highly bundled tracts from the various neurons that are connecting information. So those neurons connect and they form long, elongate, bundled, they have kind of long bundled axons that kind of provide highways for movement of the cells. The cells tend to move along 
these bundled axons. But a very encouraging development is that this kind of network structure, this kind of, this kind of anisotropic arrangement of the brain can be deduced through particular imaging. And that's through a process of what's called tractography that basically allows us to kind of create a, um, a, a kind of a, a map that is showing this kind of highly structured arrangement of these bundles of axons in the brain. And each of those can be represented in terms of a ellipsoid, which is effectively of the form of a diffusion tensor matrix. Okay. So we have actually from imaging um, a, a map of the anisotropic structure of the brain. So the way we kind of looked at this a few years ago now, actually, is basically to kind of take that kind of brain anisotropy that you get from DTA, DTI, use the information from that to characterize your bimodal von Mises distribution, generate that macroscopic diffusion equation, and then solve that to get a prediction of how the tumor is growing. And by simulating over a period, you kind of get some sort of, uh, some sort of picture um, that's hopefully describing the anisotropic um, spread of a tumor. And the way my kind of colleagues have been taking this now is to kind of take this and start fitting it and validating it against patient sort of data. So they kind of take the kind of simulation, they kind of, they kind of compare that, they kind of compare it, they benchmark it against a sort of a, a kind of a, a kind of an earlier classic model for this sort of process that developed by Swanson, which is still very much used in the literature. And then by a kind of a fitting comparison, they're, 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 they're kind of um, showing that you know, the anisotropic model is seems to be do a better job of fitting that data. Okay. But this kind of this kind of thing as well has been then kind of taken and extended by various people. And in particular, in terms of the people in the audience, I know that Martina Conte has been doing a lot of very nice work on this. So if you're interested in this area, do speak to her about some of the kind of the recent developments in this area. Okay. Okay, so anyway, that's kind of, that's probably all I'm going to have kind of time for in terms of, in terms of kind of applications. Um, there are further applications that I could kind of, um, um, speak about, but I think, you know, in terms of the, in terms of interests of time, um, what I kind of want to do instead is kind of just go now to an overall summary, basically. Okay. So what I've kind of tried to do in the um, last few lectures is really just to kind of get impress on you you know, just how kind of important this problem of biological movement is. I think you probably knew that already, but, you know, biological movement problems are crucial in a whole range of problems from the microscopic organization of cells to the navigation of wells across oceans. And in fact, they go even into this level of within a cell, because it's also important for how individual molecules are transported across a cell as well. So it's really kind of, you know, important in a whole set of different sort of areas. Now, the classical continuous models, whether or not reaction diffusion, chemotaxis, or even the slightly more modern continuous models, such as these non-local models, have typically been developed from classical mass conservation arguments. And actually, there's a lot of very good sort of success stories of those applied to explain the kind of the various phenomena that you see, whether or not in areas such as um, developmental biology or in areas to do with sort of animal movements. They've, been, they've proven a very successful macroscopic framework for understanding these sort of problems. But very much where biology is going, whether or not at kind of cellular level or at an ecological level, we're getting more and more data at the individual level data whether or not that's through cell imaging and kind of tracking cells moving under the microscope or taking animals and attaching GPS transmitters to understand their movements, we're obtaining lots more data at that kind of um, individual level data. And that, of course, then in turn means that there's more and more need 
or individual level models. So models describe this same level of detail. And, the kind of, and there's actually various models for doing that. But what I've concentrated in this sort of in these sort of lectures is the idea kind of using random walk type descriptions. And in particular, introducing these kind of two commonly used models, these position jump and velocity jump random walk models um, in order to do that. And then show how from those models, we can kind of use various sort of scaling techniques to allow a passage to recapture those kind of population level measures. But there's lots more extensions that we need to do. There's a lot more theory that's needed in these. And, that, and again, I know that, you know, a lot of people that, you know, in the audience are kind of working on those, you know. So, so you know, so you've got lots of expertise on, on these sort of problems. We need much more realistic descriptions. The effect of interactions is something that I completely glossed over. What happens if your individuals are interacting? That becomes a lot more complicated. I then get into the whole area of interacting particle systems, which is a big body of research. Other interesting things is if you're talking about things like cell migration, cell, cell movement involves linking to mechanics, how they're kind of interacting mechanically with their environment. So that's been completely glossed over in what is needed here. So we need lots of extensions. And there's a lot also of very interesting potential applications. But Biological organisms are not simple particles. All of the, a lot of these kind of theories were in, originally developed to kind of move the kind of the, you know, kind of the behavior of gases, et cetera. But biological organisms are a lot more complicated. And of course, they're interacting with their environment in a lot more sophisticated way. They're, they're kind of communicating over a large scale. Uh, you know that you know they're kind of doing these non-local interactions. Lots more interesting behavior, and actually, you know, that's where engaging with the biology can introduce lots of new, interesting modifications, extensions to explore from this system. But anyway, so there's a kind of a lot of interesting area, and if anybody's interested in any of these sort of topics, then please do contact me, and I'm happy to kind of point you in the. Um, kind of further directions for, you know, some of these sort of areas. But what I said I, I would do when I kind of provide my lecture notes is I'll provide a kind of a list of various references for the kind of the, um, the various things that I've kind of talked about. So, for example, in the context of those random walks or chemotaxis, I'll probably kind of put down a kind of a list of some of the classical sort of references, and then also kind of a list of some kind of, um, kind of review stroke textbook type sources um, where you can kind of get more kind of, you know, kind of an overall sort of perspectives on some of these areas. But anyway, thank, thanks anyway very much for your time. And as I say, I hope you enjoy the rest of your um, workshop this week. Summers. Okay. <laughs>